everybody. Welcome to Mormonish. I'm Rebecca. And I'm Landon. And this is a wonderful episode that we have wanted to share with our viewers and listeners for a long time. So you probably have had us mention, heard us mention before that Landon and I first connected, was it three years ago? Three, three years, years ago. ago. Yep. Three years ago when we started a virtual national book club called the Good Book Club uh, for Post and Nuance Mormons to get together, connect, and read amazing books, kind of as a re-education process, sort of now we know what we don't believe or what we're kind of gravitating away from. Let's try to figure out what we do believe, and we do that through reading. And it has been absolutely wonderful, hasn't that, Landon? It's been incredible. It's, we've really read some great books. Uh, and I think the one we're leaning towards tonight, or the one that least led to this podcast, uh, is Will Bagley's uh, book, Blood of the Prophets, which was just a fantastic book, a fantastic yeah. read. Yep, I've got it right here. Um, some books stand out. We've read, let's see, over three years, uh, a book a month. We've read quite a stack. Bonus, That's what's behind plus me. Bonus yeah. books. Yep. <laughs> plus a lot of bonus books. But this book really stands out. And this we read this two years ago in August um, or September, actually. It was our September book. It's called Blood of the Prophets, um, Brigham Young and the Massacre at Mountain Meadows. And it's by the wonderful Will Bagley, who we had slated to come on virtually with the book club. And then he passed away literally just a few weeks before he was scheduled to come on. So I feel like maybe I was one of the very last voice messages <laughs> that was on his phone as we were trying to coordinate that. So that was quite a loss to the community. If you haven't looked at any of his, into any of his other books, they're just amazing. He's just a treasure, a Western historian, a Utah historian, a Mormon historian, just incredible. But this book, Blood of the Prophets, about the Mountain Meadows Massacre, we read the book and about probably 12 to 15 of us met down at the Mountain Meadows. Meadows Massacre site in St. George area um, on the anniversary, September 11th, of the actual massacre. And we just had quite a, just an overwhelming experience, wouldn't you say, Landon? Oh, yeah. It, you you can't go there and not have, I, I don't know if you'd call it a spiritual experience, but it's definitely a, a moving experience as you contemplate what happened there. Yeah, I think so too. And and I'm sure a lot of you have heard me mention it before, but um, one of the first things I learned about my Mormon history when I started to realize it wasn't what I thought it was, is that one of my direct ancestors, my grandfather's grandfather, was a shooter and clubber in the Mountain Meadows Massacre. That's what he's called on the arrest warrant, because that's what he did to some of the immigrants there. And so I've you know, I'm not a very emotional person, <laughs> but that that information um, has really had an effect on me as I've tried to share it with my family at different times and nobody even understands what I'm saying. They can't even comprehend. They don't know anything because what they know is that this ancestor then moved to another city and founded another city in Utah. He's a revered ancestor, you know, just wonderful. But I, of course, know a different story that seems to be covered up. So um, when we went down as a book club to the Mountain Meadows Massacre, I painted um, some rocks. I know this is a very small gesture, but I just kind of felt like I had to do this. And I wrote things like, uh, this is one that I didn't place, but uh, it says, so sorry, descendant of a shooter and a clubber. Or I'd say things like, you know, my heart goes out or something from the, the great, great granddaughter of a militia member. Anyway, I left these at the various monuments that are at the site because there's a monument. Well, why don't you describe where the monuments are, Landon? It's very interesting how it's set up. Yeah, there's several monuments. There's the main monument that is the purported place where they've buried most of the uh, the the dead. Uh, at year a year or so later, it was the army that right. actually buried them. Uh, but then you go along the trail, and there's the point where they killed the men as the militia marched alongside of them, them thinking that they were taking them to safety. And then they obviously we know the story. They said, "Do your duties, Mormon," and the the militia shot them all at close range. Uh, meanwhile, once they heard the shots, the women and children who were in wagons, uh, several, uh, about a quarter mile more down the road, uh, they then attacked them and killed the women and the children, uh, sparing only like 16 or 17 of the children mm -hmm. who were under six years old. Uh, so it's just a horrendous, uh, scene and, uh, very moving as you walk along that and realize what happened. Yeah. And we actually, uh, we zoomed our book club meeting from there. 
So each of us were set up at a station and we zoomed out to all of our, you know, members across the country and were able to discuss and show the panoramic view as we discussed the book. So it was just, I mean, it's, it was just an overwhelming experience. But um, the day before book club, which was on the Sunday, the 12th of September was was the 11th of September. And that was the actual day that it happened. Yes, they they say things like the first September 11th. Isn't that ironic? Yeah. So we were there just kind of touring the site and we saw a large group of people and we learned that they were descendants of those children, just survivors that Landon just described. So the children were eventually, you know, they were kept by the Mormons for a while. Then they were eventually reunited with relatives back in Arkansas. And so these people that we met um, were descendants of those survivors. And so they, I guess, gather there yearly um, just to remember and to talk and to trade information and, you know, to talk about uh, monuments and, and different things, historical society. And so one woman came up to our group and I walked out to talk to her and she said, oh, are you family, right? Meaning, are you one of the descendants? And I just lost it. And I said, I'm so sorry. I am not family. I'm the opposite, you know, because I am the opposite. My ancestor killed her ancestors' parents and friends and other older brothers and sisters. So she just gave me a big hug. I felt like it was this moment kind of out of space and time, this weird vortex, you know, and everyone in the book club is just staring at us, you know, because oh, I typically very don't emotional get to watch. Yeah. 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 It was kind of overwhelming. So it was a pretty amazing moment um, there on the scene. And we met all kinds of different people and we met one person and this is how all of this ties into what this episode is about. So we met a gentleman there who was just kind of walking around. He was with the descendants and his name was Everett Bassett. And as we talked to him, we learned that he is an archaeologist. Now he's not LDS. Is that correct, Landon? He's That's not correct. a Mormon, not affiliated, but he is an archaeologist who likes to dig into historical scenes, sort of recreate them, sort of solve mysteries, right? Is that how you would describe him? What else would you say about what he does? Yeah, absolutely. I, I think there were some things that uh They'd been looking for, you know, where, where were all the bodies buried? Mm -hmm. And in some of the documents, they describe where they were, but nobody really knew where that was. And he was able to dig into it. And I think he said, what, within like, he, he literally spent 30 minutes, an hour uh, with the papers and some satellite imagery, Maps, yeah. and he found the mass graves, uh, or at least he explains why he believes those are the mass graves that he's found, uh, that of the bodies that were buried, you know, 150 years earlier. Exactly. And I guess we should sort of explain, I mean, there's not a big rush to try to figure out where these bodies are. It's in everybody's best interest in the church and here in Utah to just say, that's it. But when the immigrants were slaughtered, as Landon said before, they were not buried. They were left there on the ground. I mean, 122, I think is the number, yeah. people slaughtered in their dresses, in their clothes, and they were just left there on the ground. Um, there is some thought that it was so, it would look more like a, a native, an Indian attack, right? That's what they, or. I, I think there was uh, no desire to, to uh, approach the place again. They wanted to keep yeah. it a secret and they, right. uh, they let the wolves go and, you know, yeah. they, desecrated the bodies with the wolves and whatnot yep. and it wasn't till a year year and a half later when the army came down from salt lake to and found the scene and they were so horrified that they built the kern uh that's there to it's not the one today the church has rebuilt it and claimed it as their yeah. own even though they didn't bury anyone uh but uh the, then the army buried the bodies in some other locations as well and they left some notes that said how they where they did that and uh, this is what Everett investigated and found. Exactly. Yeah, because the church is just very nebulous. And I believe that they really don't want anybody to see these giant mounds, right? Because it speaks to how many, it's a physical reminder of how many people were slaughtered. So a lot of the monuments and things that the church had erected at first, well, first Brigham Young tore, <laughs> tore the first down. one down, right? That's a whole nother story. But, you know, they're just kind of representational. It just seems like, oh, you know, it was just let's let it be lost in memory. And, and that's just, I think, the overarching idea. But Everett Bassett, 
you know, he doesn't have, he, he has no ties to anybody here. He's just like, huh, this is a mystery. I'm going to look at the maps from the army. I'm going to look at the journals where these soldiers were so overwhelmed to see this carnage as they marched through. They had never seen anything like this, even on a battlefield. And so there were notes, there were journals, and he was able to recreate and reconstruct all of these um, using landmarks like a stream where it had been, right? And not where it is now, things mm -hmm. like that. And as Landon said, very quickly, um, and with, to me, compelling and pretty convincing evidence, figure out where these locations were. So we had Everett um, a couple months after that meeting in Mountain Meadows. Um, we had Everett talk to our book club. So what you're going to see now is Everett's um, really amazing slide presentation as he discusses his research and how he was able to determine um, where things were located. So this is a book club, a The Good Book Club episode. Um, you will see some of our book club members on the screen as they're listening. And I think that they do ask some, some questions. And this episode has been aired under our The Good Book Co Club channel and has thousands of views. I mean, people are really interested, wouldn't you say, Landon? Yeah, and we haven't published that. Uh, that was just uh -uh. from people sharing it with other people. Yeah. Uh, that yeah. got that stumbling. Many views. yeah, stumbling across it. That's exactly right. So we are really excited to share this information. And there's another reason that we're airing this when we're airing it in June. Um, the Mountain Meadows is just something that we as the book club, you know, we read about it, we think about it, we study about it. It's just it's just a pivotal moment in, in Mormon history that just represents so much, um, especially to post-Mormons who have stepped away. It just takes on a whole new meaning. So um, a couple months ago, Landon and I and some others in the book club and Mormonish friends were able to attend a play called Mountain Meadows. And this was in Salt Lake. It was written by a University of Utah law professor named Deborah 3D. And it was just a play about Juanita Brooks, who wrote the, you know, archetypal book, <laughs> one of the first books about the the truth about Mountain Meadows. It's about her struggle in trying to write this book because, you know, nobody wanted this information to get out. This was a secret. It was too close at that time in the 40s? Was it 40s or 30s? I can't remember now, yeah, but it, early on in I, the 20th century. Yeah, I think it was 40s maybe, but yeah, no, exactly. it was the 50s. I believe it was the 50s. Okay. She, yeah. yeah. So it, it, the play juxtaposes um, Juanita Brooks trying to write the book, um, flashbacks to the past with characters from the Mountain Meadows. It is one of the best depictions I have ever seen of events and just the feeling, the importance, um, the sense of why people do don't want to revisit this or think about this. It was just incredible, wouldn't you say, Landon? Yeah, it was a great play, and and uh, she was not a member at all. Uh, mm -mm, mm -mm. She just moved to Utah and became yeah. interested in the subject. Became so. interested and fascinated. Sometimes outsiders like Everett Bassett or Deborah 3D are the ones that can shine the most light, right? Because they're very impartial. So the reason I'm bringing this up is that this play, uh, the Reader's Theater version meaning that the actors who performed that we saw in Salt Lake are going to be doing um, a dramatic reading of this play. Now, this is going to happen on July 15th. And it's going to happen in Torrey, Utah, which is a tiny little town by Capitol Reef. Is that where you said it was, Landon? I can't yeah, remember. Very small town. Just yeah, really very a small place where people stop as they go to the to, to the park. Yeah. Yeah. So so they have an institute there called the Entrada Institute that is committed to providing preserving culture and heritage of that area. And the mountain meadows kind of falls into that category. So um, we're going to go <laughs> to Tori. But for those of you, it's, it's completely free. It's like this nonprofit, amazing thing. So, but the amazing part also is that it's going to be live streamed through a Facebook live feed. So anybody can listen to this. So we are going to get this information out. I think this is the first time that you guys will hear us mention it, but on our Facebook page, on Instagram, we'll probably do another PSA for it because I would like to get as many people as possible to watch this incredible reader's theater of this play, Mountain Meadows by Deborah 3D. So we'll be getting information out about that. We'll put it in the show notes, right, Landon? Yeah, the, what we've got, and then we'll uh, post it on Mormonish uh, mm -hmm. on our Facebook page and stuff as it gets closer. Yep. Yep, exactly. But um, put it on your calendar. It's going to be in the evening, seven o'clock 
on July 15th. And so if you haven't found the information, even message us personally. We, we really want to help get this information out. Apparently, if you go to the Entrada Institute on Facebook, that's where they're going to have the live feed and more information about it. But like I said, we're going to be putting this out because I cannot stress enough how amazing just kind of overwhelming, like riveting, wouldn't you say, this performance was? Oh, it yeah. was just it, one of those jaw-dropping... And it, it doesn't have yeah. a lot of actors. It, it uses the no. same actors in several mm -hmm. roles. So it's very small cast, very intimate, mm -hmm. but it it left you feeling, wow, you know, at yeah. the end. Yep, absolutely. So um, before we start the episode, we're about to start it. We again recommend Will Bagley's book, wonderful book, Blood of the Prophets, Brigham Young and the Massacre at Mountain Meadows, if you'd like to know more about the real story. And um, we also want to remind everybody about the play on July 15th, and we'll be getting more information out about that. And now, uh, please enjoy this presentation. Again, it was a book club meeting of ours about a year or so ago with Everett Bassett, Mountain Meadows Massacre Archaeologist. I think you're going to find this absolutely fascinating. Please let us know what you think in the comments. Thanks, everybody. Okay, great. So um, I have been working in uh, Utah for a long time. I actually lived in Utah uh, in Salt Lake City from about, uh, I think I moved up there around 1990 uh, and moved there and lived there till about 12 years ago when I moved out to San Francisco. Um, so I know an area about the Mountain Meadows. Uh, my wife, actually was brought in by the state to examine the bones that were excavated at the attack site. So I was a little familiar with the project. What really sort of set me off on my most recent research, which started around 2016, was when the LDS church put up these two monuments. Now, I don't, these are two, they look very similar, but they're separate. Uh, I'm guessing most of you have seen them. They purport to show where the uh, two massacres took place. Um, now, there was basically a massacre of a bunch of the men and boys, and separately there was a massacre of the women and children. So these locations were identified by the LDS church and these, um, these monuments were put up. Now, as soon as I saw these, my immediate response was, well, this is completely wrong. These are, are in the wrong locations. They're not anywhere near where they should be. And, and that really worried me because these monuments state that this is where these events happened. And when you, I mean, when you literally write something in stone, people believe it. So it's sort of like Joseph Goebbels said, you know, you tell a lie enough times, it becomes the truth. And so what worried me about this, uh, whether you want to call this, you know, an inaccuracy or, or, or being incorrect or whatever, was that, that they said, this is where these events happened, but nothing is left. And that worried me as an archaeologist, because as soon as you say that nothing is left, people stop looking for it. And so if it is in fact still there, the what's left over from these massacres, the mass graves, the skeletons, the roads, the massacre sites, they will never be protected because these monuments state they don't exist anymore. So I took this to concern to some of the descendants of the people who were massacred and I said, hey, you know, I have a concern that this interpretation is going to, um, if wrong, is going to cause the uh, destruction of the graves if they're still out there. And they basically said, well, put your money where your mouth is. See if you can find out where these are. So I started doing a lot of research to try to figure out where these massacre sites actually were. Uh, slide. Okay, now the first thing that bugged me about it was the emigrant road was identified that I thought was along the wrong location. Slide. So this red line here is where the LDS church in their 
analysis identified the road that was taken from the attack site. And you can see the attack site at the bottom. And we, we know a, a bit about the history. We know that, uh, and I'm, I'm sure I'm repeating this for everyone knows this really well. Uh, they were attacked by a combination of the Mormon militia with some Native Americans. Uh, after a few days, it appears most of the uh, Native Americans left. Um, uh, a couple of the militia, uh, particularly John D. Lee, went to them and said, well, we'll, under a flag of truce, we will take you out, we'll save you, but you have to leave all your cattle and everything here. And they led them away. And at some point to the north, uh, a group of the men and boys were massacred and a group of the women and children were massacred uh, at, at, at a different location. Uh, and just a, a very small number of very small children were left alive. Uh, now, one thing that's not really emphasized a lot is the huge amount of cattle and wagons. Uh, these were very, actually these people from Arkansas. During this period, Arkansas and Missouri was very rich. And these people were taking massive herds of cattle out to California. I mean, these were, in a sense, these were millionaires. And so we think, we always think about, well, this is about Mormonism or it's about violence. A lot of this was about economics because all of this huge amount of money brought into this very poor area stayed there. It became the property of the church elders in, um, in Southern Utah. So th that's a big issue. So if we look at this red line, this is where they said after they were attacked, they were let out. Well, my research had shown, first of all, the, the yellow line is, is State Route 18. The portion of the red line to the left, that road was not there before about 1880. So that couldn't have been the road. And then where the road ran along State Route 18, well, that couldn't have been a road either. That road runs through rolling landscape, which could only be, that road could have only been made using heavy equipment available after about 1916. So this road couldn't be possible. Therefore, the massacres and the graves from the massacres could not be along this road, could not be at the locations where these monuments were. So that, that was one thing that kind of ticked me off. Can we go to the next slide? Okay, now the other problem was uh, the nature of the mass graves was, was misinterpreted. Now I'm gonna go over the mass graves a little bit because what happened was after to the, these massacres, which took place on 9-11, in 1857, the bodies had been thrown into a ravine or, or just left out where they were and pretty much left alone for about a year and a half. And then the army came in, collected the bodies and buried them in two separate graves. So it was these two mass graves that, that were not well understand, understood. Now we only have one primary description of these graves. And this is from uh, the army surgeon. And he said that these graves, uh, each one may have had a hundred people in them, or, or we don't know exactly how many, but uh, they were quote, marked with mounds of stone. Now almost immediately people started talking about these like they were cairns. Can I have the next slide? So a cairn uh, is a monument that's raised above the ground to draw your attention to it. And this photo from 1909 by Judd is one of the first attempts from someone to identify um, where a grave was. And this is clearly a cairn. Now in my research, I just determined 
that this was a corner cadastral monument between the Dixie Forest Reserve and a homestead. But this is the sort of thing people were looking for. This is what I was looking for. This is what Carlton had built. This is what the church had built down at the attack site. A big stack of rocks, you know, draws your attention to it. Here's where something important happened. Now, as we'll see, when I finally did find the graves, they were something completely different. So this was a little confusing. People were looking for these monuments and not finding them, assuming they were completely gone. When in fact, the truth was, this is not what they look like at all. Uh, can I have the next slide? But here's another typical example. This stone is embedded in the monument put up by the LDS church for the men and boys. And it was it, it, the interpretation given that this is a cross that was put on the grave. Um, but it's clearly not. It was collected from a spot which is at the corner of a 1899 mapping of the sections of the area. And I actually tracked down the notes that the uh, surveyor had made. And you can see, uh, he says, uh, a mound of stone alongside from which a boulder bears it. And he gives some, some uh, instructions uh, marked with a cross. Well, I've seen four or five of these in the mountain meadows. And what they did was they marked the corners of where the federal surveyors came in and did their mapping. They're very typical. Uh, and it was kind of a disappointment to me that the church would interpret this as some sort of grave marker uh, because it's, it clearly is not. Uh, next slide. Okay, this is the other problem with this issue is typically when you go do a project, you want as much history as you can get. And the more history you have, the more you can build a story. Mount Meadows is very different in that the people that were writing the history were either the people that actually did the massacre, and so most of them are going to lie about it, or else they were yellow journalism who were virulently anti-Mormon, and so they're going to exaggerate the story. And there's, so there's lots and lots and lots of history, but most of it is contradictory. And this is why, to a certain extent, historians haven't been able to address these issues because so much of the history is either wrong or contradictory. Uh, and historians hate not being able to use their history. The more work they put in to track the more they wanna use it. And it's sometimes it's typical for hard, to, hard for them to say, well, maybe this is wrong. Maybe what we need to do is throw out all the history. Now that's exactly what I did. I threw out all the history and I started from scratch. Can we have the next slide? So what I did was I looked at all the history that was available and I determined that uh, there, were, there was only one source of history that I could truly trust. And this was a report produced in 1859, uh, one by um, a, a formal report submitted to Congress by uh, Major James Carleton. And the other was a, um, an army surgeon who was um, based up in Fairfield in Utah, who had come down. And uh, they had actually written reports. Now, the reason I trusted these guys is they didn't have a dog in this fight. They weren't trying to defend themselves or, or prove something or impress readers. Plus, if they had produced incorrect material, then they actually could have been, uh, you know, they could have been, uh, um, on the court, they could have been court-martialed, they could have been kicked out of the military. So 
So typically these military reports are very accurate. Uh, and so I started with those and I, I felt like I could trust, trust their reports. Um, can I have the next slide? Okay, so one of the things I did was they had actually mapped, they had actually taken measurements and several of the fifth dragoons, which was the group that Carlton led were members of the US uh, Army topographical engineers. Basically, they were mappers. And I got hold of this equipment. This is Civil War air equipment that they would have had in 1859 when they were there. And uh, down on the lower left is what's called a uh, Burt's solar compass. And then a uh, picture up on the left is an example of uh, of uh, chaining pins. And these chaining pins are still used today to, to a certain extent. But what I did was I took the data that the army had provided and then I used their own equipment and I measured out, um, I, I made measurements, you know, to like, a, I would have a professional engineer measure a point and then I would use this equipment. And I found even with my limited skills, using this equipment over five miles, I was accurate within about 40 feet. So this made me feel like, yeah, not only could we trust the truthfulness of the army, but we could also trust the accuracy. Next slide. Okay. Um, is there some way I can get rid of your pictures so I can read this? Um, I guess I can, oops. Whose picture are you seeing? Um, I just lost, well, I just, okay, now I just see your picture. I think that's fine. I had the pictures of everybody that was on the call off the one side. Um, okay. So um, the army report gave us some landscape clues. Uh, and these are the ones initially, the only clues I used. The first was that the graves were marked with mounds of stone. Notice they don't say they were um, cairns. They said the men and the boys massacre site was located a very specific distance from the immigrant tax sites spring. So we know where the immigrants were attacked at the spring. That is that location that you go to where the main interpretive section is, where you go down, drive down and you walk across the creek. That's where the initial attack was. Okay, so we have the distance. Now we also know that the men in the boys grave was 15 degrees west of north, which is the same as 345 degrees from this spring, uh, that the, these, this is what the, a massacre site. Now the boy's grave location was 50 yards to the west of that point in a ravine lined with oak scrub, that the women's and children's grave was another 350 yards further on to the north, and that the women and children had been massacred in an area characterized by heavy brush. So these are the clues I started with. I threw everything else out and I started with these. Um, can I have the next slide? So now, because this information said they knew the direction that the massacre was and the distance, that should be really simple, right? So if you look at this purple arc, that's the distance. And you look at the pink line, uh, that is the direction. So we should know exactly where this massacre took place. Unfortunately, it's way up in the mountains where there's no roads. So there's something screwy going on here. Now I told you the army stuff was accurate and truthful. But here it seems to be wrong. So this is, this is kind of a confusion. So I sort of went back to, to the beginning again 
And uh, can we have the next slide? So I, I went back and I thought, well, what might be left of, of the remains? And so the first would be the massacre sites themselves. And I figured I'd never be able to find these looking for them because there really wouldn't be anything left. The massacres at each location took place over, I don't know, uh, five, 10 minute, maybe half hour period. And they would mean any articles artifacts left, maybe some musket balls or some clothing fasteners or something like that. So I wasn't going to be able to find the massacre sites by looking for them. The other was the, the mass graves themselves. Now this was possible, but most of our evidence suggested that they would have been demolished or, or covered by cultivation. And so I figured, uh, you know, like if they had been knocked down, they would just look like a bunch of rocks, which are all over the mountain meadows. So I thought, well, I'm not gonna be able to find the mass graves. But then the third would be the roads that they would have followed. And I figured, okay, I know a lot about historic roads. I'm gonna to try to find the roads. And if I can find the road they used, then I will narrow down where the graves might be. I can go and maybe I can find the graves. And if I can find the graves, then I will know where the massacre sites were because we knew the graves were next to the massacre sites. So this is a direction I took for that. Next slide. Okay, so this basically just shows what, what I was left with to start with. Down at the bottom, we see the attack site. So we know where that was. That's where the monument is. Now the yellow arrow at the north is where we, for the very first area north of there, we know where the historic road was that they took when they were led away. So somewhere between the orange star and the yellow arrow is the road that they took and also the massacre sites and the graves. Next. Okay, so then I determined a couple of other information from the data. Uh, one is- Everett? Yeah. Um, uh, Spencer asked a question. He said, at this point in your journey, who owned this land and did you have to get permission to do the work that you were doing in this area? Um, well, it's, it, it, it's different. Um, some of the land is owned by the Dixie National Forest. Some of it was owned by ranchers uh, who I got permission from. And uh, some of it was land that I, um, I didn't get permission from, but I was able to check out anyway, uh, because it's public. You, in Utah, you have public access. There's no trespassing laws if they are no trespassing signs. So it's a little tricky, but I would typically, I would just go and knock up on the door and I would say, hey, I'm doing some research. And they would just let me walk across the land. Uh, now, if I was going to actually excavate or something, of course, I couldn't do that. But these people were all very friendly. Um, OK, uh, so what we found was uh, where it says Abe Spring, this is where we know there's a spring there today. And it's surrounded by cottonwood trees. And we know that this is where the militia was camped. And we also know based on a lot of the accounts that the uh, militia mustered, meaning they all got together and waited at this spot called the muster spot, the muster site, which I call the muster site. And so that gave me some additional clues. Um, next slide. Okay, now when I try to find where something is on the ground, before I try to figure out where it is, I try to figure out where it isn't. And I know that doesn't make a lot of sense, but if you can get rid of some areas, it narrows down the areas you have to search. So these brown blobs 
are areas where I know the road could not have gone because they're, they're mountains basically. And so the road that got from the lower left corner of the map to the upper right corner had to avoid those brown spots. Now that was a big help to me. It narrowed down where I was looking. Uh, next slide. Okay, the next thing I looked for was I looked for old traces of the abandoned wagon road. And uh, these are difficult to find when you're on the ground, but sometimes they can be really easy to see uh, from aerial photography. Um, Landon, can you run your line up and down where those old roads are? I think people can see them. There's one there and there's one a little bit to the left. And this area is a little bit muddy. So what would happen was, you know, maybe, you know, in the spring when it was muddy, they would move a little further uphill, which is why you have separate roads. But as you can see, those are old roads that were used a very long time ago. They were never paved and they were, um, and they were abandoned a long time ago. And these happened to be the roads that were used um, up north of the attack site. So these, these sorts of roads I was able to identify. Uh, next slide. So these red lines are where I was able to find really good examples of old road trace. We call those traces of the old roads. So um, looking back and you know, walking back and forth across these fields, looking at aerial photographs, looking at old aerial photographs, there were a few from the 1940s, I was able to figure out where some old road traces are. So as you can see, we're trying to get a clue about, about where this road might have been. Um, uh, next slide. So the next thing I did, oh, go back one. Uh, can you go back? I think if you hit a uh, page up, one more. There we go. So then I was I went out and I by using historic maps and, and and doing more survey, I was able to find roads that were old roads, but were still in use. And these were mostly, you know, old road, you know, old dirt roads used by the ranchers uh, to get to their fields and so forth. And as you see, I was able to identify some that were appeared to be on the same alignment. Um, and then uh, if we go to the next slide. Okay, so this would have been my, inter my initial interpretation of the road that was taken when they left the attack site and they were taken back north, supposedly to go to Cedar City, but actually, in fact, to go to the uh, to be massacred. Now, this road actually had a name, and it was called the California to the Salt Lake to California Road, and it was a wagon road that was originally constructed around 1847. Now, if you look at the portion of the road, I don't know if. Landon, if you can see where that creek runs down, yeah, that one, run, run, run your line up and down that. That alignment is actually the route of the old Spanish trail, which was neither old a Spanish or a trail. It was in fact a, a pack trail, a pack route taken by Mexicans from Santa Fe starting about 1829 and going to Los Angeles. So this whole corridor is, is a location of the old Spanish trail, but it wasn't a trail that you could take wagons on until about 1847. And then the older road was so badly degraded that in many areas they had to build a new road. So that's what we're seeing here in red. 
Uh, okay, let's go to the next slide. Okay, so let's go back to that information we had before. Now we had, uh, we had a distance and we had a direction where the massacre took place. And we decided because the intersection was up in the mountains, it didn't make sense. So when I determined the road, I had a third, a third factor. So this pin is at a location along the road that, the, the, that I think the wagons took, uh, the exact distance that the uh, army engineers mapped it to be. So I'm thinking, well, maybe somehow the direction got wrong. Maybe the distance is right. And, and if they did try follow this road, this is where the massacre would be. Uh, so I decided to check out that area. Can we go to the next slide? So here is that location. So if you look along where it says the wagon road trace, that you can see that is where the old route went, the old 1840s, 1850s wagon road that I'm pretty sure that they took. So not that one, but the one over to the left. Yeah, no, yeah, it's very faint. It's where the, yeah, right along there. That's an old wagon trace. And if you were to stand on that in the ground, and I hope one day you all get the chance to do that, it's almost invisible. It's just a tiny swale. It's maybe two inches deep. It holds a little more moisture than the surrounding area. So you actually see it on aerials because there's more vegetation. So the pinpoint, if you, if you can run up where that pin, pin is, uh, where, the, where the little stick pin, where the little stick pin, yeah. That point is on the road and is the exact distance given by the army engineers. But you remember they said, okay, this is where the massacre took place. But then they said the grave was 50 yards to the west in a ravine with oak scrum. So if you go 50 yards to the west along that green line, that's where they said the grave would be. And of course, there's no cairn or anything there, but it is a ravine and it is filled with uh, oak scrub, as you can see. Uh, okay, next photo, uh, next slide rather. So this is, it. so if you look down at the bottom, which is F1, that's what we just looked at. Uh, and, then if, and then if you go 350 yards to the north, like, like they said, uh, you'll get at that point where it says F2. And if you look carefully, you will see at both of these locations, there is a little bump in the creek. Can you see this? F1 is a little easier to see. Okay, let's go to the next slide. Okay, so this is the southernmost one. And when you look at it, it really looks like a pile of rocks that the farmer dumped in the, uh, in the, in, in the wash. But why don't we go back to the last slide again? So down at the bottom, that tree you just saw in that photo, that's that tree there. And if you go over to the creek right there, that's that pile of rocks. That's what we're looking at there. And the stick pin, that's where the massacre took place. Um, okay, let's go back again. So when I walked out there, I actually stood on this pile of rocks and I was looking around looking for a cairn or a grave or something. And um, I couldn't find anything. So I was a little disappointed. I had to use the bathroom. So I went down in the creek bottom to pee and I looked up and I noticed this pile of rocks was not a informal pile, but it was actually a rectangular built structure, like nothing I had ever seen before. Uh, and that made me very curious. Uh, and so that's when I started investigating these rock structures. Now, 
I call these tumulus. This is a tumulus or the plural is tumuli. And in archeology, span a tumulus is where you put a pile of rocks over a mass grave. The term is mostly used in places like Greece and Italy, but since it fits so well here, I've been calling these tumuli. Uh, so this is the one that's located where uh, the, the army claimed that the men and boys grave was. So let's go to the next slide. Okay, now this is the one to the north. This is uh, the last one when I measured out, it was within five feet of where the army said it was. This one, which is where the women and children's grave was, is about 40 feet off. Uh, but again, it just looks like a pile of rocks. Okay, next slide. So one of the things I did to try to interpret these was I, I um, put a camera on the end of a 40 foot pole. And this allowed me to take vertical photos that, that allowed me to determine the structure of these a little bit better. Uh, could I have the next slide? So if you look at this one, this is the Northern one, the women's, the women's and children's. As you can see, it's actually a rectangle. And it's a little hard to see because some corners have collapsed and there's bushes growing on it. But this rectangle measures four feet high, eight feet wide and 12 feet long. And the outer side are made of large rocks and the inside is filled in with small rocks. What's even weirder is most of the rocks in this area are sandstone, but not a single piece of sandstone was used to create this structure. So uh, these rocks are all basalt or granite. So obviously if a farmer was throwing rocks off his field, he wouldn't have uh, distinguished between sandstone or other types of rocks. So, so I started to think, well, maybe what we're seeing here is some sort of sepulcher, some place where, uh, where the graves were put by the army. Uh, next slide. Okay, here's another photo of the same. Now, from this angle, you can see a little better. Uh, Landon, can you point to the bottom of the grave? Uh, you can see the large rocks, yeah. So you can see how big the rocks are outlining it. And if you look at the top of the pile, you can see the same thing. Yeah, there we go. And then these rocks in the middle are all quite small. So it looks like what they did was they cut a shelf into the edge of the creek bank. They built a large rectangular box out of these large rocks. Maybe they put the bodies in and then they filled it in with dirt and with smaller rocks. So we're beginning to see, okay, well, maybe this is some sort of grave site. Next. Okay, now this hey, is Debbie, down. Uh, yeah. when, when you say they, we're talking the army here. That, yes, that we're talking the army. army. We're talking an army that was sent by the federal government. And these guys that actually built this were from Camp Floyd, which is up uh, near Fairfield, just south of well, where is it? It's, it's kind of south, southwest of uh, Provo. And, and this burial would have been a, a year afterwards or so? A year and a half. There. A year and a half. A year and a half. And we have a good description of them going around and collecting the bones and collecting, you know, that there was, you know, women's hair, curls of women hair and bits of fabric caught in the sagebrush. And collecting all that. So the, these wouldn't have been complete bodies. They would have been the remains after the wolves had, and that's and correct. The decay and everything else. They would have been basically bones. So they, this is another term for this would be an ossuary, a place where you collect bones. So, um, and yeah, I mean, certainly there could have been a little flesh attached, but the, the reason they did this is these bodies were being attacked by wolves. 
And they were shooting wolves in this area till around 1921, big timber wolves. Um, and so it was considered to the federal government that this was sacrilege, that these bodies were not buried. Now, why the local Mormons or the local ranchers didn't bury them, uh, I'll leave that up to you. Uh, there's several people have come up with ideas on why they wouldn't do that. Um, maybe to keep, you know, as a warning to, to other settlers or things like that. But for whatever reason, these bodies were not buried until the army came back and did it. Um, and I think I just saw a question there. Um, we do have some descriptions that they were buried in, that some of the bodies were buried, but when the army came back, they didn't say that. And we think what happened was they threw the bodies into this, into this ravine and then they covered it with uh, pieces of sagebrush and things. Who knows, maybe they threw a little dirt on top of them. Uh, at either rate, it, it wasn't really sufficient. And it's also possible that some bodies were buried and that we just don't see them. Um, but the fact that the cadaver dogs that came out couldn't find them is suggestive. And I'll get to that in a moment. So this, the Southern burial, it's, it's, I've drawn in this rectangle. And as you can see, it, it's a little screwy looking, but this one is actually identical. It's both of these are, are running exactly east west. Both of them are four feet high, eight feet wide, and 12 feet long. Now, this, um, this one, because it was so high up, they built these things around the edges. Now I call these skirts or um, uh, you could call them whatever you want, but they basically protected the upper part where the bodies were from being washed away. Um, and you can see basically one on the south side and one that's partially washed away on the west side down in the creek. Next slide. This is what it looked like on the north side. The entire north side had collapsed and was falling away when I found it. And for a couple of years after I found it, before we figured out what we should do, I would go back and each year four or five rocks would have fallen off. So this whole gray was ready to collapse. Now you can see uh, up on the, on the sort of left side, you see that line of rocks going up and down. Okay, that's one of the walls of the sepulcher. That's one of the parts of the triangular box. You can see that wasn't just that. Now, one of the big concerns with uh, this land was a private land, but the LDS, the LDS church bought the land. And um, this has upset a lot of the descendants, but you know, as far as I'm concerned, the church has done a really good job of protecting it and basically throwing a lot of money at it. Now, one of the things they did was uh, we designed a way to, to stop this collapse. So could I have the next photo? Okay, so last, uh, last January, we came out and we repaired this. Uh, the LDS church hired a, uh, a firm to do this work and they did a wonderful job. They also hired an, a, a hydrology company to figure out how to keep this creek from down, down filling. And they've, they've done some things with that that I think are all good. Now, look at this picture and then let's go back to the last picture. There we go. Now, at the bottom of this photo, this whole hill has been built out for about six feet. Let's go back to the new one. So that's all filled with rock in there. It's incredibly substantial. You could drive a Volkswagen up this hill. And then on top of that, they threw a bunch of dirt 
and they put some grass seed down. And through time, this dirt's going to, going to, you know, the rain's going to cause it to go down between the rocks, but there will be grass growing then and everything. And what this does is this has saved this grave from collapsing because if that grave had collapsed, all the bones in there would just have tumbled out into the creek. And uh, that would not have been a good thing. But um, I think what they did here was really good. I think uh, I was very impressed. I, out th I was out there, they had me out there the entire time it was being built. I assisted a little bit and um, I think they did a really good job. Uh, hey, Everett, how, how long did it take you to find, you know, you're showing all the, the roads and stuff. Was this a, a weekend project or years in the making or how long? Well, the, the um, off and on, I, I mean, I'd obviously I didn't get paid for any of this. So I was just, you know, playing around. So it took me a while. When I decided that I knew where the road was and I knew where the army said the distance was, I went out and it took me about 12 minutes to find it. Oh uh, I just basically walked exactly where the army said it was. And so, you know, part of me is saying, oh, wow, I did a really great thing here. I discovered these graves. No one has known where these were for 160 years. Uh, I discovered it. But the other part he's saying is, well, we, I went exactly where the army said they were. And I walked right there and there they were. And so it, it's kind of like, uh, these should not have been lost. Uh, we just didn't go about looking for them in the right way. Uh, or the wrong people were doing it perhaps. I think Tom has a question. Sure. I think others have a question. I don't know if it was answered. How do we know this is a gravesite? How do we know the bones are in there? Is okay, there... I'll get to that in a minute. Okay. 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 Just, great. That's, that's <laughs> what's on my mind. You don't have to rush. I just Good. no. Okay. Great. About it now, like, well, okay. So let's you. go to the next slide. Okay. Now this is a uh, pocket gopher, and at the men and boys, but not the women's and children's. There's a bunch of these, and those teeth you see there, they like to chew on bones to keep their teeth sharp. And so these apparently have been going down into the grave. So if there are bones in there, we really don't know what sort of condition they would be in because clearly these guys have been going down there and gnawing on them. Okay, next. No, oh, this is just, um, this is just a, a little odd thing. This is a, um, a sandstone slab that was laid up next to the men and boys grave. And this thing is about 16 inches square. And it's been worked along the one side. You can see on the left side and up at the top corner, it's been chipped away. Now, I don't know what this is. I suspect it was collected and put here as a sign by the army. Uh, typically they would take the axle grease and paint something on there or maybe paint, or maybe they thought they were gonna do it and they never did it. But it's clearly uh, what, what archeologists call an eco fact. It's something that was brought in here by humans and put next to the grave. Um, and that's still there to this day. Um, I'm guessing they had something written on it in, in uh, Axel Grease, and it's been washed away since, but I just don't know. Next slide. Okay, now this is kind of interesting because this grave that we found is something that I had seen before many times when I was living up in New England and I had been helping farmers. Because what the farmers do there is they do, uh, uh, they, they take the rocks they find on their fields. Now, if they took the rocks off the field and put them in a pile, through time, that pile would just start spreading out again through entropy. So what they do is they build a big square box out of rocks, and then they throw all the smaller rocks inside. And it keeps the rocks in a very small area and it gives them more room to, to um, the farm. And this is a really classic, this actually, this picture here is actually from Connecticut and probably dates to the 1850s. And uh, what I noticed that 
many of the soldiers who were on the detail to build these graves were from New England. So they actually knew how to build this. And then th these, these look exactly like, like the graves we found. Uh, kind of another uh, slide. Here's another example, a bigger one. This one's actually still being used by the farmer, but he thinks the farmer th thought it dated back to the early 1830s and his family's still using it. Obviously it's much bigger than what we're looking at. Next. Now, what's interesting is the same style was used for graves in New England. This one is from New Hampshire. So we have a, a rectangle made out of rocks with the body put inside and then filled in with dirt and rocks. Now you can imagine if someone died in the winter, the ground would be you know, frozen hard. And this is a way you could bury someone with, um, without having to dig a hole. So again, we have perhaps an extension of a, of a functional way of stacking rock that had been applied to a sacred use. And I've also seen photos from the Civil War where Civil War soldiers had built similar mausoleums, uh, sepulcher, I don't know what you wanna call it, but it was of something that bodies would then put into and wild animals and coyotes and wolves and dogs could not get to them. Next. Okay, now what's really interesting and, and a lot of people don't know this, I kind of discovered this, is most of you guys know that um, Carlton built a cairn down at the attack site uh, when he was there in 1859. And then supposedly within a couple of years, Brigham Young came and he, he did something like he, he swung his arm out and he said, vengeance is mine, get rid of it. And, and then it was torn down. Uh, but what a lot of people don't know is in 1864, another army officer showed up, uh, Captain General Price, George Price. And he got there and he saw that there was no monument there and he thought that was wrong. And so what he did was he built a monument and he described it as 12 feet square at the base and four feet high, compactly filled with loose stone and earth. So what he built is exactly the same thing that, we, that I found and which had been built, uh, what, um, five years earlier. The only difference is his was 12 foot square instead of being 12 by eight foot. Um, now this photo is from the uh, execution of John D. Lee. And this is actually all that's left. Now, now this, remember this is down at the spring. So there would have been a lot of cattle, you know, walking around this area, getting to the springs. And, and it's completely what was built in 64. So this was 77, this was 13 years later, has mostly collapsed. But so we do have this essentially third monument of this type. Uh, next. Okay. Now as a scientist, whenever I come up with an idea, I try to falsify it. I try to say, okay, maybe I'm wrong. What else could it be? So. It's clearly a constructed feature. And I thought, well, what else is out there? And, and I've actually recorded tons of, of features out in the, in the, in the West. Uh, the most likely things would be a tent house platform. Like, you know, you see miners, they build those little wall tents. They'd make little platforms. A livestock, livestock loading ramp for, for um, getting cattle to go up into the back of a wagon a bridge abutment or a retention wall. Well, these don't make sense for any of those, particularly because most of the rocks are roundish. I mean, imagine trying to build a, a house platform out of bowling balls. It just doesn't make sense. Now, the other, the other possible thing that it was, was that it could have been uh, results of field clearance. But because the rocks were carefully stacked, which no farmer would ever waste time doing that, but also because none of the 
of the ubiquitous sandstone in the fields was collected suggests that that's not true either. Now, I've also had some people suggest that these were check dams built by the CCC. And I've proven that the CCC did not work at this location, but also a check dam, by definition, has to go across the stream. You can't just have it on one edge of the screen, stream. It doesn't make any sense. So, so by looking at these other possibilities, I, I remained convinced that a, some sort of grave structure was still the best option. Next. Okay. Now what's also interesting is the, you have these two structures, but they're not random. They're similar in some ways. Um, first of all, both of them are located within this old eroded Spanish trail corridor that had eroded into a ravine. The second was that they were both on the east side of the ravine and each one are oriented exactly east-west. Uh, now, a Native American would never do that. Um, so it's, it's clearly something historic. Um, that, the, uh, that the construction was the same, that they were rectangular features, they were raised, they were made of large rocks on the outside and small on the inside. Uh, the other thing is the rocks seem to be carefully uh, sized and material selected. Uh, they were the same size and shape. The upper part was eight foot wide, 12 foot long and four foot high for each. Now these are interesting figures. Those of you who do carpentry or anything know that historically people build things in either four or 10 foot increments. So we have two by fours, you know, studs are eight foot long. So having something built in the historic period that would be eight foot wide, 12 foot long and four foot high. That's the sort of thing you would expect. I mean, if it was, you know, seven foot wide, uh, 18, you know, nine feet tall and three feet high, it would be a little curious, but it's not. It's in this typical four foot long measurement. And the other thing is they all look to be the same age. They're partially collapsed. They've got lichen growth sedimentation, stream diversion is all the same. Um, yeah, Verna, we, we had a question, if, if not sandstone or boulders of this type of basalt found in the mountainous areas surrounding, in other words, where, where did these rocks come from? Were they just not as plentiful as the sandstone or did they actually bring them in from somewhere? No, they're pretty common. Uh, they're they're um, what we call colluvium. So there's bedrock in the mountains and, you know, and it, you know, over millions of years, it breaks down and the things roll down in the valley. And in fact, if you walk up and down the creek, you'll find lots of, of pieces of rock. So it's fairly common, but sandstone is also common. And if you're gonna, if you have a field that you wanna plow and there's a basalt boulder in it, and you're taking that basalt boulder out of your field, if there's a sandstone boulder there, you're gonna take it out also, but they didn't do that. And that's, that's what's kind of curious. Um, next slide. Okay, let's go back to the last slide. Cause there's something, there's something, another thing that's interesting. Although these two features look almost the same, they're very different in, in some ways. The Northern one with the women and children is much more carefully built. The big rocks are bigger. The small rocks are smaller. The smaller rocks are all about almost like the same size. They all look like softballs. The outer ones all look like bowling balls. The men and boys to the south is just a little bit sloppier. The rocks aren't carefully selected. Um, they're not stacked very well. The other thing is the Northern one doesn't have the skirts uh, and, the, and the Southern one does. So what this almost looks like, two groups of people who were given the same instructions 
but we're working independently. And that's exactly how the army works. We know that they were two groups of men that were sent out to build these. They were given the same instructions by the captain in charge, but they were working separately. So the fact that they look the same and the fact that they're somehow different seems to, I think, further support this idea that these were built by the army in 1859. Next photo. Okay, now another thing was, was they took human remains dogs out there. Um, now the church actually did this on their own and I wasn't really big on it because I was thinking, well, because a, a lot of people didn't want these to be the graves. And I think a part of it was because, well, if these are the graves, people really have to think about it. Them. You know, if you have an actual, the graves with the bodies, you have to say, yeah, people were really massacred. This is a real thing. And, uh, and I was afraid that if they brought dogs out, you know, these bodies were like 160 years old and the dogs didn't find anything, then people would say, oh, well, yeah, the dogs identified that there were no bodies here. That, uh, so these are not the graves. And that worried me because I was thinking, well, maybe the dogs could be wrong. I don't know, I've never worked with dogs before. Now these dogs are interesting. They're not cadaver dogs. Cadaver dogs are specifically trained to smell live humans or recently dead humans. They smell human flesh. There is a company in Sacramento that they do, they, their dogs are trained just to smell old skeletons. And they've claimed they've been able to find like 3000 year old burials and things, but they are really, really good at finding like one, two, 300 year old bodies that are nothing but bones. So they brought four dogs out. This, this is not them. This is them working on another project. But they brought four dogs out and they, would, uh, they drove about half a mile away and they let one dog out and the dog would run around in big circles, big circles that got increasingly smaller. And then they would freeze and then they would take a beeline and they would go over to the women and children's grave and they would sit on it. And then they did the same thing down at the Southern. Uh, of the four dogs, three of the dogs immediately identified both graves and the fourth dog uh, identified the one grave but not the other. Now the people running these dogs were really flabbergasted. They said, they said these dogs, you know, there must be a lot of bones in there because they were like, these dogs were running like over like 800 feet once they got the sniff and they went right to the graves and they sat down. And then they started shuffling around because they were confused. What they're trained to do is smell the best location. And because these graves were large and had a lot of crevices and cracks, these odors were coming up at different locations. So on top of these graves, these dogs would like move around trying to get the best smell, but never leaving the top of the grave. So I was like dumbfounded. I was out watching them and, and um, pretty much everyone involved has said, yeah, there are a lot of bones in these graves. So someone had asked me, um, how do we know the bones are there? Now, I don't believe there's ever gonna be any attempt to go in and look at these graves inside. Uh, I don't think the descendants want that done for the most part. Some do. Some say, you know, I'm a Dunlap. I want to, I want to, I want you to look at the bones and do DNA and tell me if my descendants in there. But for the most part, most of them want them left alone. The LDS church doesn't want them, wants them left alone. So uh, I, you know, I don't think we will ever have any more evidence than we have right now. Now, I could go out there and I could collect the dirt, you know, that's eroding out and test it for potassium, I'm sorry, for phosphate and say, yeah, there's bones eroding in here. But I think we have pretty much all the data we have, we want, we need. We, we have these structures that don't fit any other function. 
exactly where the army said they built them and put the bodies in. And then we have no other place indicated where the graves could be. And we have the dogs saying, yeah, these are where bodies are buried. So I'm, I'm happy. I'm moved on with my life. I'm not, I don't do this anymore. I'm pretty much done. I'm happy to talk to you guys about it. But um, uh, I think we found uh, what we're looking for. So can I have the next slide? Okay. Now, let's go back to where I thought maybe the Army had screwed up. As you recall, they said the attacks, the massacre site was 345 degrees from the spring. And the distance was, uh, I forget, it was 6,575 feet from the spring. But what happened when I was actually up at where I found the, the grave, can you point to the other? point on the other side. Yeah, right there. Uh, I realized that when I looked back at the attack site spring, I couldn't see it because as you can see, there's a mountain in the way. But when I looked back at Abe's spring where the militia had been, I could see it really well. There's a whole bunch of big cottonwoods. So I think, so then I shot back with the compass and I found it's exactly 345 degrees from the gravesite to the spring. So I think what happened is, is one of two things happened. They measured from the spring to the attack site. Um, and then they backshot to not the attack spring, but the spring that they could see. And somehow these two got conflated. And, and what people assumed was the attack site spring for the direction was actually Abe's spring. So as you can see, it's, it's, I mean, it's a huge, if, if that weren't the case, this would be a huge coincidence that they were both, that, that this spring was 345 degrees. So I think we figured that out. Um, next slide. Okay. I just go over this really quickly. Um, this creek uh, where these graves are, I've always been called Upper Mogatsu Creek. But my research, and what I did was I went and I researched um, weather patterns measured at the Presidio in Monterey, California. Because as you recall, no one was living here back in the 20s and 30s when this trail was being used by Mexican packers. But we do know there were some huge, huge storms because the storms before they came here, they hit the Presidio in, Mex in, in Monterey and the priests there wrote down what was happening. So we know that there were a lot of these huge flash floods that turned this pack trail into a, um, into a ravine. Uh, and now, so, so people, you know, by the late 1850s, when people were coming through, it started to look, it looked like a ravine. And now it actually looks like a creek. And I guess it is a creek, but it wasn't a creek back then. It was just a little swale in the, in the, in the meadows that got worn down. Now, if you look at the little uh, stick up at the north, can you point to that? Yeah, now you can see how straight that is. Let's go to the next photo and we'll see what that looks like. Yeah, see, this is it. This is the old Spanish trail. And as you can see, because there's stone there, you can see the stone in the middle, it didn't erode down like it did further south, which was just really soft dirt. So this is the old Spanish trail and uh, this is where their wagon was taken. So this is between where the boys and men were attacked. And if you look up to the north to where that power pole is, those trees, that's where the women and children were attacked. Uh, so when they were up there, they could hear the gunfire 
that were killing uh, the men and their family. Uh, but what's interesting about this area is this, these, these examples I'm showing you of the Old Spanish Trail are among the best preserved examples of the Old Spanish Trail in the Southwest. And so what you have is, is at this one location, you have what I consider and what most people consider the two most important historic sites in Southern Utah, the Old Spanish Trail and the Mountain Meadows Massacre. And they're right on top of each other. You got like a twofer. So that, that's kind of interesting. Okay, let's go to the next slide. Okay, now one thing that's interesting is, is in the records, uh, this, this juniper tree here, it's the pictures take so far away. You see over in the corner, you can see the men and boys grave. Just beyond it is the road. Um, this tree is actually probably between 350 and 400 years old. It's a very old tree. It would have been a very large tree in 1857. Now, uh, the, the, the diaries of some of the people who did the killing said that they walked along to a prearranged point where they stopped and they killed it. Now, I'm thinking, I, I have suggested that this tree, which would have been the only tree there of that age, uh, may have been that prearranged point. And so the descendants have, have taken to calling this the witness tree, because the tree witnessed a massacre. I think it's a little romantic, but anyway. Um, the other thing though, as you can see here is, this landscape is really quite nice. It, it, it really looks almost the same way it did in 1857. You can't see the road. There's no ranches or houses. And we're actually working with Rocky Mountain Power to take down these poles and make the line underground through here to sort of preserve that landscape. The next photo. Here you can see the witness tree. And it's probably has a diameter of about three feet. It's a, it's a good sized tree. Was there another question there? Yes, um, Spencer was asking, um, let me, uh, sorry, I lost the, he says, we know the tree is the only landmark to rely on now, but how do we know there weren't more extant trees in that location back then? We don't, and that's an excellent point. No, we don't. Uh, this seems to be, you know, it's right next to the grave, so it's probably around the center of the attack site. Um, and there could have been trees that were even older. So that, that's a very good point. And that's why it, I think it's a little romantic to call this the witness tree. I have suggested that this could have been the marker, but, it, but there maybe there wasn't a marker or maybe it was another marker uh, somewhere else. So we don't know, that's, that is an excellent point. Next. Okay, now this is up where the women and children were attacked. And as you can see, it's quite brushy. And this depression you're seeing through the middle, I don't know if Landy, you wanna to point to that? Yeah, right through there. Now that is the road they take. That's actually the combination of the old Spanish trail and the California trail. And uh, it's still there and it's, it's in really good shape. Uh, but these bushes are, are fairly unusual to be here. Um, can we go to the next one? Now, what I did was one of the uh, young girls uh, who was, uh, her name was Triletha or something. I, I can't remember it exactly. But she referred to uh, where they were attacked as Sedgebush. And Sedgebush is a firm that, term that's not used anymore, but it's it's in the Bible, it's in the book of Job, and it basically means marsh plants. And so what I did was I went out and I did, um, I took a core, a soil core, and I cored down and I identified this area that's shown in pink here 
is actually a location of an old uh, wetland, a seep. Uh, the, the, the soil is moister, it's darker. There's evidence that there was a spring there. Now, since, you know, in the 160 years since, you know, there's a lot of wagon, a lot of wells have been put in, the groundwater has dropped. But this area is still uh, quite wet and there's a lot of bushes here. There's a lot of uh, service berry and there's a lot of uh, scrub oak. And this, you know, the descriptions of whether you conclude that it was the Mormons hiding in the bushes to jump out or the Indians or a combination of both, you would understand that it would have been something pretty easy for them to do. The area is very brushy, would have been much brushier and much marshier back then. Uh, and then you can see where the little red arrow is. This is after the uh, assault, this is where the bodies were dragged and most of them were dumped, we think. And that's where the grave is now. Um, now, when these women and children were attacked here, uh, they weren't at the head of the, of the parade. There were actually two wagons further up the trail that were carrying wounded and some very small babies. There were two wagons and John D. Lee was with them. And they had gone up to the, what they called the rim of the basin um, by the time the attack started. The women actually, when they were attacked, a lot of them ran away. They ran to the east, up the hill into the bushes, and they ran to the north, up to where John D. Lee and the wagons were, because maybe they thought they would be protected there. But so, Unlike the men and the boys, who each had a militia member standing next to them, and uh, the leader said, men do your duty, each one turned and shot the one next to them. Apparently, there were a lot fewer people gunning down the women and children, so they, they spread out, they ran out. So the bodies, when they were actually found in 1859 by the army, were spread out over a much larger area. And these little, these little, um, these little stars are just where different, different people describe the attack taking place. Uh, and as you can see, they're all pretty much in the same area. Now, the only one who actually measured, um, measured exactly uh, was the, the northernmost one, Carl, where Carlton did that. But they all seem to be in this area, and this is where the grave is, and this is where I've determined that there is a uh, there is a spring. Can we go to the next one? Okay. Now, one of the bushes out there, and it grows nowhere else in the valley in, in the mountain meadows, is this this tree, and it's called service berry, and the descendants who are mostly from Arkansas, the descendants of the people massacred um, were kind of freaked out because service berry uh, is called service berry because it blooms in the very early spring when they tend to have their, the, the ground uh, falls and they tend to have the memorial services for burials and it's used for funeral services, which is why it's called service berry. And they, when they see service berry, they think of it as a sign of sorrow and remembrance. So the fact that the only place that service berry grows in the mountain meadows is at this location, that kind of affected them. I thought it was kind of sweet. Um, next. Okay, now, after all the massacres, the few children that were allowed to survive were taken up north to the north end of the valley to this guy's property. And this, of course, is Jacob Hamlin. And he was a really interesting guy. Uh, he was a missionary. He spoke several Native American languages. He was a businessman. And he had a, uh, he wasn't there for the massacres, but he was, um, uh, he had the land in the north end of the valley. Can I go to the next?
So I tried to figure out where his house was because no one really knew where it was. Now, most people assumed it was up. If you look up at the upper right picture, you'll see that big yellow blob. That's a, a little town site called Hamlin, but it, it, it didn't come around till about the 1870s. So it has absolutely nothing to do with either Hamlin or the Mountain Meadows Massacre. But our old friend Carlton did take a measurement to Jacob Hamlin's ranch. And so when I went out there, I sort of knew where to look for. So this red line that you see is the original Old Spanish Trail. Uh, and I was able to find it. Now this line, the purple line is what's known as Leech's Cutoff, uh, which is part of the California Salt Lake Trail. So the immigrants, when they came south, they came to Cedar City, they cut across old Highway 56 uh, to where um, the uh, iron mines are, if you guys know where those are. And then they followed this road, which was, was, you know, dates to the 1840s. It's called Leech's Cutoff. And Jacob Hamlin built his ranch right at the intersection of these two roads. So whether you were coming north, you were coming south, or you were coming west, you had to go right by his ranch. So he had a, he had a uh, little blacksmith shop there. He sold fruit and, and, and meat. And so he was a good businessman. So um, I was able to find uh, two adobe melts, one for the farmhouse and one for the barn, and also a frame building, which had where he later had a blacksmith shop because I was able to identify the, uh, the mount for the forge. Now, um, the, uh, when the immigrants first came out, this is what they came right by the Adobe farmhouse that was being built then. And they said, hey, where can we camp? And they said, oh, go down to the south end and there's a spring down there. So that's where they went. So this is where they were told where to go. Uh, now, were they told to go there because they, the people that told them knew they were gonna be attacked? Or did they not know? It's, that's one of the questions we may never know. But um, let's go to the next picture. Uh, I was able to map the, the uh, Adobe house. Now this is not that house, but this is a house that was built, almost Adobe house, almost the exact same size uh, and, and built within five years. So this is what his Adobe house would have looked like. And what happens, when they say you build an adobe house, you have to keep its hat and its shoes dry. Meaning that if you lose the roof or if the base is exposed, the whole adobe is going to collapse and turn into what's called an adobe melt. So let's go to the next photo. And this is what an adobe melt looks like. Uh, now I was able to find uh, there weren't any standing walls, but I was able to see the adobe melt, and I was able to find the outline of the rooms and a lot of historic artifacts. So we know that's where um, Jacob Hamlin Ranch was. This is where the small children were taken, and they were kept there for several weeks. And that really is the fourth major location for Mountain Meadows. So we have the attack site. The, when the men and boys attack site, the women and children's attack site, and the Jacob Hamlin ranch. Next slide. That might be the last, yeah. So um, what's going on now is um, I'd like to, why don't you, do you, do you want me to turn that over to me and I'll, I'll do the run flyover? Yep, you, you should be able to go ahead and share it now. Okay. This is a little flyover of where the route was. And what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna take you in an aerial fly through so where you can see where they were attacked and where each of these actions were and, and where they went up 
to the Jacob Hamlet Ranch. So um, let me put my glasses on so I could see this. Now, if you have any questions, just ask me. So we're gonna to start to fly over here. So this is where the attack started. This is no, we, where- We can't see it. Can you, uh, it doesn't look like you're sharing it. Oh, right. I need to share it. Um, While you're doing that, I, I do have a question. When you said that they, sure. you, you, you had the measurement to the uh, Jacob Hamblin home, was that from a that massacre was from site? So does that- uh, That was from the spring. All of Carlton's measurements was, were from the, the attack spring. Okay. Um, and so this was like, like six miles away. So it was pretty far. So can you see this now? Yep. Yes. Okay. So this is the monument. I think most of you have been there. Here's a parking lot. And we think that the actual big circle where they had their attack, where they put their wagons in the traditional Western, you know, put your wagon, circle the wagons was right here on this sort of Northeast corner. And the, um, the, the I, I didn't want to obscure the landscape. So the route I think they took is shown in this very light green. So I'm going to run you, fly you down there. So hopefully we can see where they went. Now, the first thing is, is how did they get across the creek? And I found evidence on an old map from 1910 that there was a kind of a ford here. So I think it's most likely that rather than coming across here, they would have come. Remember, they had their wagons. Uh, and if you guys have walked across there, you know there's no way to get wagons from here to there. But but back in the day, you could have done it here. So I'm going to ever go can when the when the attack started, do we know what direction and where they were initially uh, when they attacked them? Were they surrounded completely? Was it from one side? Do you know that? Yeah, I, they were surrounded, and we know we know a lot of the Native Americans were up. There's some big boulders up in here on this hillside, and um, and they were uh, and there was also some up here somewhere. So when they were trying, so the spring was down here. So to get from where they were camped down to the spring, they actually couldn't get there without getting shot at. And that was a big problem. They really were running out of water. Uh, and so that indicates that there were some people over here. Um, now there are a few people that have done more research on the, the actual battle than I have, but there are places up in here where you can actually see where musket balls have hit into the rock and spalled the rock off. Mm. And, uh, People have compared them to, you know, what a musket ball would do, and and there it's pretty clear that's that's where they the, the where they were originally the attackers. Okay, um, so um, and, and just to be clear, this route is after they've surrendered, where they were taken. This is after they've by, surrendered by Lee. Yeah. Let's see what's happening here. Okay, so they came across here. Now this field was put in, in winter, winter wheat in the twenties. So there's nothing visible. So this is this little saddle they had to go over. So they, were, they came up along here and somehow they came up here. Now, when you get up in here, you can actually see the old route. But down here, it's all destroyed. And this is where they came up, and this is where the militia was. We know this is the way they came because Nephi Johnson, among others, said, you know, we brought them along the base of the hill uh, where we turned 90 degrees to the left and went straight north. So this this makes sense. Some and, and just for reference, that that area up up 
on the top of that hill is the Utah State Monument where you the lookout, the lookout point for those yeah, who right here. There. So that gives this you a little is, bit of a. This is called Dan Sill Hill. And this is where they have, there's, there's a monument here. Um, so then they came up and this road is still here. Uh, some of it is used by the farmer. Some of it just has traces, comes up, uh, crosses this irrigated field and uh, comes up. And then right about here, we start seeing the old trail trace again, really well. Okay, so this is where the, um, th this align along here. Now we actually know they were, how many there were, they were six feet apart. So they were actually strung out from about here to about here when they were attacked. And this is the grave site. Now three of them escaped and, and ran across the ravine, but some militia members on horses chased them down and shot them somewhere over here. So then um, comes up north. Here we have that old portion of the Spanish trail. Um, and here we have the, um, this is the area that I determined was an old, old spring area. This is where we think the women and children were massacred. Now I put a point here, but in point of fact, the massacre really probably took place over this whole area. This is where they were initially attacked. This is where they were ambushed. And this is where the, the upper grave is. Can, can you show us in reference to where the, the site is that's marked for those who've been there? The one that the LDS church put that in? The LDS church marked? Yeah. It is I think it's right about in here. I'm trying to figure out. Uh, it's possible that this this uh, photo imagery was put in before they put it up. But I think it's right in here. Yeah, I'm having trouble seeing it. So it's it's in the area, but the men's one in is the quite, area. The, the men's one is is quite a bit off. The men, the men and boys is quite a bit off. The women's and children is actually closer. And this is the rim of the basin. So this is where the wagons were coming up. And by the time the the women and children were attacked, the wagons were here, and some women and children ran up here and were gunned down here where the wagons were. Um, and then this continues up. You can see the old, the old trail in some areas. Now this, all this land is owned by the church now. This is the old cotton property. Now up here, you can see, there's some good examples of the old road. Here's some really good examples. Comes up here. And it starts to go up toward the very northern part of the meadows. And, uh, and then right here, is where the Jacob Hamlin Ranch is. And that's where, that's where the story ends essentially. Um, so that's kind of what I have. Uh, I'm happy to answer your questions. I'm happy to talk about what's happened with the land. I'm happy to talk about um, the interaction between the uh, descendants and the LDS church, what the LDS church has done, what the LDS church I think they would like to do, uh, what the descendants would like and how those might differ. Um, so anyway, I can talk as much as you want. 
Could, could you tell us a little bit about, uh, I know we'd, we'd heard that maybe some of the family is, would like to have a national monument that's, that's run by the government and how the church owning the property affects the narrative that's being told and how they'd like to see it told through maybe a national monument and if there's any progress of that happening. Yeah, and I wanna be careful here because um, there are actually three different descendants groups and they don't always get along. I mean, we're, this is like Hatfield and McCoy country where they live. And so there's a lot of, um, you know, oh, well, I'm not gonna join your group because your great uncle stole my pig sort of thing going on. Um, I think most of, I personally think the LDS church is doing a good job of preserving, uh, preserving this land, preserving the sites, protecting the graves, uh, making sure it's not overrun with tourists. Uh, they've done a fencing. They, I think they've done a really good job. Uh, I agree with the descendants that the LDS church controlling the narrative of what happened is not necessarily a good thing uh, because the LDS church is always going to spin it uh, in a way that is is uh, not going to hurt the church. Now, you know, in the hundred years after it happened, the story was that this was something that Native Americans did uh, to the immigrants, and the church members aren't weren't involved. Now, that story has changed quite a bit, and I think there's not a huge amount of difference between what happened between. Uh, LDS historians and non-LDS historians. Uh, Will Bagley's interpretation that, um, that um, Brigham Young was involved, uh, I think there's probably some truth to that, but I think Will probably exaggerated it a bit. I think Brigham Young set up a situation and, and George Smith uh, that this could happen but not that he directly caused it to happen. Um, so th there's a lot of, you know, there's a lot of disagreements and everything, but I think the church is doing a great job of preserving it. I don't think the church should be in charge of interpreting it. Um, I don't know that necessarily if this was a national monument, um, it would be a whole lot different, but I think the descendants would feel a lot more comfortable not having the church make the decisions about how this is interpreted. Um, toward that end, um, there's some talk about trying to get uh, the federal government to buy this land or perhaps trade it for, um, there's an area up in, in uh, Wyoming, um, can't remember. It's where a bunch of handcart um, people were were oh coves coves for not coves for it. Yeah, Martin Martin, Martin Hancock. Martin, 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 Martin. Yeah. Yeah. No, we know the LDS really wants that land, so we were thinking, well, maybe we could work out some sort of trade or something. Now, if this ever happens in the next twenty years, I would be really surprised. I've been sort of, I've been helping the descendants sort of you know, figure out how maybe best this could work. Uh, when I talk to people in the LDS church, like church history, some of them say, oh, yeah, well, this is a real headache. We, we would really like the federal government to take it over. And some people say, well, we don't think the church authority would ever let that happen. So we're not, we're not really clear what's happening there. Uh, but yes, I would like to see uh, I, and, and I don't necessarily think this needs to be about the massacre. I would like to see an old Spanish trail, Mountain Meadows uh, National Monument, where the hist it would be about the history of the area. And of course, a big part of that history is the massacre, but that wouldn't necessarily be what it would entirely be about. That's, that's sort of my feeling. 
I don't know if I answered your question. I don't even remember what your question was. Oh, but, it, it was just about if there was any progress with that actually happening, but you kind of explained that. So. No, I, I think we're, we're trying to maybe set up a meeting between uh, Mitt Romney and a senator from Arkansas. Uh, these things take a long time. And I think it's kind of, I mean, you guys know more about how the church works than I do, but I think if not doing this is an embarrassment to them, eventually they'll do it. Uh, now, how long that will take, I don't know. Uh, it may, you know, it may take, two or three presidents go by before the momentum comes around, or maybe it'll always say uh, belonging to the church. Um, I'm, you know, I don't have descendants buried here. I don't have, I don't have a dog in this fight. It doesn't make me super angry or anything like it does to some descendants. Uh, like I said, I think that the area has been taken care of, but um yeah, I'd like to see a, I'd like to see a national monument here. I think uh, Steve had a question, and then uh, Rebecca. And if anyone has a question, just raise your hand, and we'll we'll call on you, and you can you can ask Everett. Steve, you want to ask your question? Yeah, sure. Um, so, um, Everett, I, I I just dropped in a little late, so I haven't been able to catch much of your presentation. Um, I just had a few questions. First of all, have you published anything? Um, yeah, I have an article that's coming out in the uh, Journal of uh, Historical Archaeology. It's called, it's actually called Historical Archaeology. And um, I'm also having, um, I think I might submit an article to uh, Utah Historical Quarterly. And then um, uh, Shannon Novak and I are thinking about putting together a book of chapters about Mountain Meadows, but it would be it would include a whole lot of things, like it would include uh, changes in the environment. Uh, it would probably have a chapter on how the monuments themselves have changed and so forth. Uh, now, one of the reasons I didn't publish pretty quickly is after I found these graves, we really didn't know what to do about them. We we wanted to make sure that people knew of their existence so they didn't get destroyed. And we found out later that the farmer was planning on filling the, um, the ravines with old trucks. So they would have been destroyed. Um, but we didn't want, but you know, if, we, if, we pub if I published on them, everyone would know where they were and people would be coming and climbing all over them and they weren't protected. So for many years, we waited while we figured out. So we told the, the LDS church about it. We told the descendants. Uh, eventually, uh, the, the, the descendants were trying to purchase the land from the owners uh, or get an easement. Eventually, the LDS church bought the land, uh, and they only got the fence put up last year. So I didn't feel like I... I was ethical for me to publish uh, in, because of that one grave was if anyone walked on it, it would completely collapse until it was um, stabilized and the whole area was fenced. Now that's happened. So I am, I feel free to publish on it now. Okay, so um, my follow-up questions. Uh, one, um, did you uh, watch the movie that came out about 15 years ago, the dramatization? about the Mountain Meadows Massacre. What did you think of that movie, how accurate it was? And then the second question I have is, what particular book about the Mountain Meadows Massacre do you think is the best book out there? I didn't see that movie. I, I like to see it. I heard it, it wasn't very accurate. Is this the one that had- um, John Voight. John Voight is Brigham John Young. John Voight and Terrence and Dean, Stamp. Yeah. And Dean Cain was Joseph Smith. Yeah, yeah. I heard it wasn't very accurate at all. Um, and there was like some love story in it between a Mormon and a non-Mormon. So I haven't seen, I'd love to see it. I'd love to watch it. Um, now your second question was. What is your, what, what do you think is the best book overall? Oh, okay. About, about okay. It? Well, I would, um, 
Well, the best original book was uh, by um, Juanita Burks. And it's, I believe it's called The Mountain Meadows Massacre. Um, I think Will Bagley's book is really good. But I think if you read Will Bagley's book, you might want to temper it with the book that the LDS Church wrote. And it's by uh, Turley Walker and someone else. And they're apparently coming out with a second volume. Now, there's a lot of that I don't like about that book, but it was written before I found these graves. Now, apparently they're coming out with a second book. And I know that Barbara, Barbara Johnson Brown or Brown Johnson is editing it. Oh, with the Mormon mm-hmm. History Association? Um, I think that she's with them. So, yeah. She is with them. Yes, she is with yeah. them. And I think the book is being published by Oxford. So yeah, I would I would recommend um, uh, I would meant Will Bagley's book, but I would also uh, read these two books by the Church that are uh, one that which is out and one which isn't out. Now another book I'm hesitant to recommend. It's actually by my ex-wife Shannon Novak, and it's called House of Mourning, and it's a very um, academic book about, it's actually, it's about the, the people who were massacred. So she's actually done a, a biocultural analysis of this population of people. So she goes back, she does a lot of genealogy on them. She had analyzed their bones. She did a lot of work on the diseases they had. So it's sort of the kind of work she does. It's sort of peripheral to this whole story, but, um, it, it brings that part that no one else is right. No one really writes about the descendants. And, and she does. She's interviewed them. She, you know, spent several years in, you know, in Arkansas, you know, once a year, summer, she'd go down there. So it's a, it's a good book. You might want to check it out. Thank you, Everett, um, for answering sure. the questions. It's sure. uh, almost 11 o'clock here on the East Coast, so I don't think I can stay on much longer. But okay. uh, <laughs> But I, I wanted to get that question in. So, yeah. hey, everybody, okay, love, love all of you. And, uh, okay. Well, thanks for staying up. <laughs> yeah, thank you. Rebecca. Yeah, well, thank you for recommending some books. We are a book club, after all. appreciate that. So I was under the impression that the LDS Church did not own the land where you found these graves. So this is new to me. In fact, I had read some articles when you first um made the discovery and the church spokesman seemed to say, oh, well, that's kind of interesting. We'll have to look into that. You know, it sounded almost very skeptical. So um, maybe since I didn't know that, at what point did they actually purchase the land? They do own it now. Am I correct in understanding what you're saying? They do own it. Okay. And, yeah. and they, in, in fact, I'll, I'll, <laughs> I'll, I'll go out a bit. They had bought a bunch of land that they thought covered things, but they were wrong. Mm-hmm. Uh, and and so they had bought um, they had bought uh, all this land up in here, and they had bought all this land up and down here. The one area they missed was the area in the middle where the graves were. And the guy who owned it oh, was a man named uh, Mr. Entz, and he was a very very friendly man, he and his wife, the family, the Entz family is uh, pretty, there's a lot of Entz's in St. George. You know, you see Entz dentistry and Entz real estate. Uh, and he was a real nice guy. He was, um, he was very friendly to us. He ended up selling it to the LDS church. Uh, and I'm thinking that was probably about three years ago. So basically when I've, when I found this in the first couple of years after I found it, it was correct that the LDS church didn't own it. Did the families right. ever want to try to purchase it just to protect it and keep it? Okay. Well, the the Enses, the, the, the Enses had owned it for a while and they didn't want to sell it. And I don't know what sort of pressure the LDS church might have put Were on the Enses them. LDS themselves? Yes, yeah, yeah they oh. are. Yeah, yeah, they're good church members, and but but you could tell that I got the feeling they didn't want to sell it to the church either. I, well, they're they, pressure. They ended up doing it, and I think it was a good thing. I, you know, because the church has the resources to jump right on it and take care of it, and they did. 
They fenced it. They provided money to preserve this one thing. Now, even if this had gone to the descendants or if it had gone to the government, neither of those entities probably would have had the resources to, to jump on it so quickly. So I think it was a good thing that the church has it. I don't, I don't think it would be a good thing if the church kept it, but we'll see what happens. They're not going to promote it with signage. I like what you said before when you said when people, if they really showed those, you would have to imagine how many people really had been killed that were in there. So you don't think the church will put anything out there with signage where anyone could see what really happened? Well, so they, they consult with the descendants and there's big fights on what the word should say. But there's also big fights between the different descendant groups. <laughs> so right. It's not, don't think of it, this is like the descendants versus the LDS church. Um, some of the descendants uh, are real happy with the church and some aren't. So it's, it's a mixed bag. Um, the church doesn't want to like make it so people will be able to walk down right down to the graves. Mm -hmm. And the descendants are very happy with that. And I think that's a good idea too. Um, I think the interpreting the area is nice. And I think um, uh, I think there could be some new signs that, that provide a little more information. We'll just have to see. Are they going to move the existing markers that are in inaccurately located? No, I don't think they are. Okay. And, and I don't have a problem with that now because I had a problem with initially because their presence put the actual locations in danger because they were saying, look, they were sort of saying they were in this area, but there's nothing left. Now they still sort of say that, but because we've protected the graves themselves, any damage that could do isn't a problem. So I don't have a, I don't really have a problem with that too much. Uh, I like I don't think that signs should say, well, you know, if you walk 600 feet in this direction, you can see the graves because we don't want people walking down on those graves because they would just collapse. So I think um, I think that's good. Um, I think you know, like at some point, I could see some point in the future there being like maybe a little tiny little visitor center that would have a more nuanced discussion of the mountain meadows. Now, the other thing that's, 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 that I haven't mentioned, but I've done a lot of research on is um, the position of the Paiutes. For 160 years, they got blamed for this. And, they, and, and we don't even know that the Indians were Paiutes. We think some of them were, you know, were other, other groups that were living you know, in the area or something. And so they, you know, this, this is like bad, bad medicine for them. They never talk about the mountain meadows. Uh, they were blamed for it. You know, people in Cedar City would spit on them because even though it was the people in Cedar City that had done the massacres, they had convinced themselves it was the Paiutes. And it's just a horrible, horrible situation for the Paiutes. I think much more, I mean, of, of all the people that were hurt by this, I think it was the Paiutes, and their story is is rarely told. Now, there's a guy in, um, I think Rebecca, you may did you meet uh, Logan Hebner? He was with me. Did we meet Logan? I think I might have been passing. It was so quick. Yeah. I did he, meet a descendant who said she felt that the Paiutes had never apologized and uh, owed some of the that descendants. Patty. Apology. Patty. Yeah. Was well. That Patty? Yeah. Anyway, so that was an interesting perspective that they felt the pilots should apologize because I, I share your perspective more. She, so, she, she said I, the pilots should apologize? She said one group we have never heard from as far as an apology to the descendants is the pilot Indians. Oh, and, okay. Uh, you know, I think they were, they deserve an apology. <laughs> like well, I, yeah, I, I, now it may have possibly that one of the people you were talking to wasn't a descendant. Well, it was, it was Patty. The one oh, who it was, was Patty. Oh, okay. 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 He's well, the first I, person we met. I share with. your I share <laughs> yeah. your perspective that they were a victim also of the situation. No, so, I agree. Sorry, I tell agree. us about Logan. I think we may have crossed paths briefly, but I didn't remember everybody. 
Yeah, I rarely, I rarely agree with Patty. <laughs> so, um, yeah, Logan is Logan. Actually, he lives right there in uh, Rockville, and he um, has been working with the Paiutes for many, many years. And he's been writing their histories of of you know what their grandparents told them about the Mountain Meadows massacre. And so he's like his his research is really really interesting. Is he the guy that owned the land? No. Oh, okay. Because we met. No, oh, okay. he's a he's a youngish guy. He's probably fifty. He lives over in uh, Rockville, and he's the uh, yeah. He's a, he's the guy you should talk to. He actually wrote a book about the Paiutes. Uh, if you're looking for books to read, um, but yeah, like so, the Paiutes, their story has been pretty much lost. And uh, yeah, it was kind of weird that Patty would have said that because. Uh, I'm not sure what they have to apologize for. <laughs> I mean, they were basically used. Yeah. I mean, basically, there was a lot of evidence that that they were coerced by um, by Gandhi Lee in, into the initial attack. He was in charge of feeding them. He uh, they didn't have any food unless John D. Lee agreed to give them food, and um, so they were in a really bad situation. So Everett, um, since you aren't a descendant or, you know, like you said, you kind of don't have skin in the game, what brought your interest to come here to look for the sites or, you know, to do this research? Uh, you know, were you well, hired by was, someone or? Well, part of it is, 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 you know, I'm an archeologist and I saw that the archeology span that was you, being used in the history being used to present the situation was bad. And so where, I was. Where like, did you see it initially? I guess how did how did you well, hear I, about the site? Well, I guess on those on those on those new monuments the LDS Church put up, saying, "Well, these are, you know, th that was sort of implying that this is where it took place, or that the uh, graves have been destroyed." And so that kind of got my blood riled up. I said, "No, that's that's wrong." You know, I imagine it would be like if you were a carpenter and you walked down the street and you saw a house that was built really badly, you would look at it and you'd say, I would like to make that right. And that's, as an archeologist, that's, that's all the equivalent, where I said, I wanna make this right. And it wasn't because, it wasn't necessarily because I, you know, you know, I had, you know, these strong feelings about, you know, the descendants. I knew a couple of descendants, but uh, I just wanted to get the story right. Were, were you introduced it irked, to it irked me? Were, were you introduced <laughs> to the story by your ex-wife's involvement with the forensic or yeah, you... pretty much, pretty much, okay. pretty much. And that's a whole different story because um the when the LDS church was putting that monument in down at the attack site, they didn't do good archaeology and they stuck a backhoe down, they pulled up a whole bunch of bones that had been buried down there and because when human bones are found the state well, I was has to step to in to try and correspond a little about yeah. oh yeah I should get up. Mm, yeah dakota's here yeah so the step the state has to step in and so they had her do it but then the governor of the state who was levitt was the grandson of one of the people who was doing the massacres. So he stepped in and basically shut that whole thing down, which was being done by state law. So that was a whole confusing thing as well. Well, we appreciate it, Everett. When Lana and I first went there years ago, we read the signs and thought, this doesn't seem to add up, but we didn't know what to do, but you did. <laughs> so thank you. <laughs> yeah, we'll see how it goes, yeah. We'll see how it goes. I think, you know, I think the main thing is I think the, um, we know where things happened and it's been recorded and it's being protected. And part of that is in spite of the LDS church. And part of that is to the credit of the LDS church. The, the bones that were, that were dug up at the Cairn, um, how, how did those get there? So it, it appears there's almost yeah. like three graves then. Yeah, there, there are. Well, basically what happened, it's a little confusing. 
So the guys from the soldiers from, from Camp Floyd came down, they collected the bones and they made the two Northern graves. And then they, um, and then when Carlton came up two weeks later with his people, he said, oh, you guys really botched it. You only went around and collected the big bones. He had his soldiers go around and collect bones that, that the guys from Camp Floyd missed. And since the two graves that I found with you know, the skulls and the long bones were all done, he had these scraps of bone taken down to the original attack site where the bodies of the people that were killed in the initial attack were buried. And he had them re-dug up and then he had all them put together. So yeah, you're right, there are three, three graves, two done by Camp Floyd and one done by Carlton. I, I've just got to applaud the work you've done. It, it, that's just incredible. And it's a story that none of us, I don't, I don't know, maybe somebody's heard of this, but this is, it, to me, it's just amazing and, and very fascinating. When I was reading the book and it would say, they said that they had measurements directly to the, and I'm going, well, yeah, they must know you could go measure exactly where it was, but uh, it, it appears you, you took that and it may have been just off a little bit because of the spring, but yeah, it, it seems like someone did, did that and found it. So. Yeah, and, uh, and most of the, like I said earlier, most of these people that were doing this research are historians. And uh, I'm a landscape archeologist. So this particular story is a story that, that my experience has made it helpful for me to find it. Uh, there's lots of stories where you need, you need to be a really good historian. But this is, this is not one of those. There's another um, massacre site up in Circleville where some Mormon pioneers massacred a bunch of uh, Indians. And again, it's something we know very little about. We don't know where the bodies are buried. Have you been there? I have been there. And I think <laughs> I know where the bodies are. And I yeah. think I know where the bodies are. <laughs> where the bodies are buried. You're that I guy. Think yeah, I think I'll take a break. <laughs> Yeah, it's, it's um, the descendants, both the descendants and the church are really emotionally involved in this. And when you hang around with them, it, it kind of drains you. <laughs> I can see that. Like yeah. I said, in our book club, it was difficult to read that book and kind of live with that for the whole month. And I mean, I'm glad we did it, but uh, it was a struggle some more for for some more than others, if they had, you know, a personal connection and, but I'm glad we did it. Um, it's just, so do you mostly read nonfiction? Uh, well, yes, yes. We have different categories that we read. We read um, science, philosophy, humanities, human interests, um, human sexuality, <laughs> um, mm -hmm. Bible studies. Um, our philosophy of our book club, since a lot of us are post-Mormons or nuanced Mormons is, now that we know what we don't believe, we need to figure out what we do believe. And that's by reading everything in sight. So, so all your books have, have something to do with Mormonism? No, or, not at all. No, Although okay, okay, okay. For example, our first book we read was Sapiens. I don't know if you're familiar with that, just the history of the human race. So you can, uh, sort of like our mission statement says, it's through the, the lens of Mormonism, sort of when you read okay. these books which lots of times as Mormons, we were encouraged not to read history, science, philosophy. When you read those, you kind of juxtapose that with how you were raised or what you were brought up with, and you started to see a whole new perspective on things. So we just try to read everything and anything. <laughs> and we vote on the books in our club. So we read what people are interested in reading. Did you read Under the Banner of Heaven? Yes, we did. And I, I went have, massacre. Another heavy. <laughs> I, I haven't read that. that. Site. I so, haven't read that yet. I need. Oh, I, I always wanted to read, to read that. that. They're making that into a mini series on FX. I don't know if you watched. Oh, really? I, yeah. And they are going to, of course, discuss the Mountain Meadows massacre as part of that mini series because it, it's heavily oh, cool. look as a precursor, a point of view sort of a thing um, that sort of led indirectly to Under the Bed of the Heaven, just that mindset. And so I'm hoping. Um, because series on FX are wildly popular, that this will kind of bring Mountain Meadows out again. So I'm looking forward to 
it may actually happen. But yes, we read that book and members of our book club who live um, in the area like me got my Starbucks and drove to the massacre site and took a picture where I was smiling. And then I thought, that's probably not what I should be doing. So then took another picture where I looked very serious. But it's an excellent book. I would recommend it. Highly recommend it. Okay, I'll have to get it. I'll yep. have to get it. And it talks a lot about the Mountain Meadows Massacre in it. So. Oh, do they? Okay. In a, yeah, in a relevant way. So it is, I think it'll be a that's lot great. of people's first introduction if they watch that series that's coming out sometimes next year so. Hmm. Yep, highly recommend. So do we have any more questions for Everett, anybody? It's how many, boy, we've achieved a two hour block. This is incredible. Cool. I just wanna say thank you so Hi. much. This was really interesting. I really appreciate it. And Melinda and Landon, thank you so much for emceeing this. <laughs> oh, I'm glad you enjoyed it. Yeah, it's a very yeah. interesting. <laughs> Karen is a book club member who has never been a member of the LDS church. So oftentimes I think people read books and kind of go, oh, what? Especially this one, huh? Did not know about yeah. this part. Oh, it's every day is a learning experience. <laughs> yeah. But I think you made the comment um, during our book club meeting about um, Will Bagley's book. You said I was you know, raised in the United States. I took history all through school. Why is this never mentioned anywhere? Which is because it is a major event if you look at the scope of it, unlike anything else. Yeah, well, and the Tulsa massacre too. I mean, who ever heard of that? Yeah, I just thought oh, yeah. about that yeah. last year. So there, you know, history is very interesting. It's all about who's telling the story. Now, the uh, I don't know if you enjoyed reading Will's book, um, but he has a book which, again, I haven't read yet. But it's about um, it's about white Native American relations in Utah, hmm. and it's called the Whites Want Everything. Everything is two different words. So anyway, you might want to check into that. I don't. I don't. I'm not suggesting it, that you read it. No, nope, that on the list, everybody. It. Yeah, yeah, <laughs> it's on the I list. Have, yeah, yeah. We yeah. have we have a list that we collect all throughout the year, and um, so at the end we have probably a hundred books that we vote on because there are so many good things that we want to read. So we do one a month. So okay. and, but we're and, never limited to what the book club says. Oh, never. We always have yeah. extra books too. And suggestions. Oh, yeah. and, Maybe I should join. Maybe I should join. Uh, oh, absolutely. Absolutely. You would join. Yes. Yes. But we would absolutely love it. So I'll send you an email if you want to. Okay. You do, so that. Just, you do that. I think I would enjoy that. Every second Sunday. So just once a month. So it's not too complicated. It's just in the morning. It would be 10 o'clock your time. And we just talk for a couple hours about the book that we're reading. And we have a Facebook page that we chat during the month about it, but you don't have to be on social media if you don't want to. And yeah, it's a really great group okay. of people. So yeah, I think I'd enjoy promote, that. Promote, promote, promote. <laughs> yeah. You can help us find all the bodies. In our I can help you find the bodies, yeah. That's right. So do we have any more questions for Everett? Well, Everett, tell me the name of that book again. I was busy talking about logistics here. Melinda is our list keeper. So I am. I'm a note taker. Tell, tell you what? The, oh, the, name, the name of the book, book you were just saying? Oh, I think it's called The Whites Want Everything, but everything is two separate words. And I think it just, he published it just like two years ago. Okay. And I, and I don't, I don't even, I haven't read it. I can't tell you it's a great book, but it is about, um, it is about something that no one else really writes about, which is, is uh, Native American white relations in Utah. Okay. Did you say who the author was? It's Will Bagley. Will Bagley. Oh, it is Will. That's Will Bagley, okay. yeah. yeah. Okay, perfect. Right up our alley, that's excellent. All right, well, if we and oh, Merlin just I, popped in. Can I ask you to unshare the, the map there? Stop sharing your screen. Here it is. Okay. Anybody else? Or we'll just go to our last slide and wrap up here. I'm just going to say, I'm glad I got to pop in here. I didn't get to read the book with you guys, but I met these wonderful people at Thrive. And um, that was really interesting. So thanks. Okay. Thanks so I'll say goodbye to you guys. All right. Bye, Everett. Okay, Thank bye. You. Thanks Thank you, a lot. Everett. Bye, Everett. Bye-bye. Bye. Bye. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks for joining us for another episode of Mormonish. We really appreciate our listeners and would love to hear from you if you have a story you'd like to share. You can email us at mormonishpodcast at gmail.com. You can also find us on Facebook, Instagram, and on our website, mormonishpodcast.org. 
And don't forget to look for us on YouTube and like and subscribe. Keep joyful, everybody.